Hi there guys, it is Poober here and in today's video we are going over the much requested topic of train signaling. Let's start with the basics by talking about how Factorio's train tracks work. For starters, train tracks can be broken up into what Factorio calls blocks. Each block can be thought of as a unit of length defined by the start of one signal, like we're going to place here, to the end of another signal, which we just placed there, and then by clicking on a rail signal or a chain signal in your inventory and holding it in your hand, it'll come up with some colors, and those colors delineate a block system. So you can see the new block that we just created is in this red color here, whereas we still have a separate block on either side of the new block in this yellow color here and here. So the bottom train track has definitely far more potential for multiple trains to be traveling in the same direction on this one train track, whereas the top train track, because it's only one color as a result of not having any signals, can only allow for one train to be traveling on this one track. When it comes to deciding where to place your signals, there are a couple of things you need to decide. The first one being, what side do you want your train to drive on, left or right? And this is highly debated, but ultimately it is up to you and your preference for which side you want to drive on. But once this is decided, it is recommended that you stick with that decision for the rest of your train network or else your trains will have pathing errors. Ultimately what this boils down to is that on any given piece of track, your signals must be on the same side as all of the other signals. A good example of that is looking at this pair of train tracks here. We have the train signals on the right hand side or the outside of the track, as you can see with this signal here, here, and then here all the way at the very bottom, which means that looking from this angle, the train would be traveling in an upward direction on this piece of track. By still following the same rules of having the signals on the outside of the track as we do on this train track, as we see here, here, and here, that means that if we had a train on this track, it would be traveling in the downward direction. Left-hand drive can be thought of as having the train signals facing more towards the inside of the train tracks like we do with this pair of tracks here. What this means is that this track, for instance, will have the train headed in a downward fashion, whereas the train track here will be facing an upward direction. And then here's the same concept, but in a horizontal manner, whereas the bottom tracks demonstrate right-hand drive and the above tracks demonstrate left-hand drive. The next thing to consider is what is the max length of a train that you want driving on your tracks? This is an important decision because it will influence how far apart you place your signals, with the idea being that you don't want anything longer than the max length of your block. A commonly used train length would be a 242, which would look something like this. What that means is we end up having two locomotives at the front, four wagons in the middle, and then two trains at the end, which could be considered the caboose. If you wanted to use a shorter train, you could do a couple different options like a 212, which would look something like this, which means you have two at the front, two at the back, and one in the middle. And that would mean that you end up shortening your block by moving up the train signal there. You could delete that. And then what you could do to make sure you have the same distance apart for all of your blocks is end up taking a blueprint of the signals, get rid of that, get rid of that, and then that way you can actually measure out how far apart your blocks need to be. This, for instance, would fit a 212 between all of these blocks here. If you wanted to use a longer train, like a 363, for example, You would essentially measure out the length of the train and then go ahead and place your rail signal behind it. Measure out like we did earlier with the blueprint for the distance and then you can duplicate that for the rest of your blocks. And then that way you can confirm that the block behind it will also allow for a 363 train. The other thing to consider when deciding your train length is whether you want to have the option to reverse your train or not. In the previous example, I did have a 242 train or a 363 train or you know, anything like that that ended up having a caboose, but that was with me making the assumption that I did want my trains to have the option to reverse. But you could decide to have your trains only have 
the front loading locomotives where your trains would be forced to end up pulling through the train station in order to get on the opposite side of the track. Or you could end up doing the option like I did, which allows me to have locomotives at the back, which does allow the train to reverse, although that does end up complicating the train intersection as you can see with this mess over here. But let me give you an example of what that means and what that looks like. We have this train in the station here and it wants to get to this train station over here. Instead of having to extend my tracks and have it loop around and end up getting to this train station over here, it does have the option to end up just reversing because I do have two locomotives at the back that are actually facing the opposite way than these locomotives up here. All I have to do is have it click to go to this other train station and you'll see it reverse nicely like it does here. Now to demonstrate how a single header train, which is this one over here works, let's go ahead and set it to the same train station. And you can see it has to end up pulling through that train station only going forward to end up getting here. So this one is definitely more versatile. This one is less complicated while this one is definitely more complicated. So really it's up to you and your skill level with how complicated you want your train network to be. Now that you've got your train length, driving side, and whether your train will be one directional or bi-directional figured out, it is time to start planning how you will lay out your tracks, junctions, and begin signaling. For the purpose of this example and simplicity's sake, we will be talking about one lane in each direction, but as your base gets bigger, you may find yourself needing multiple lanes going in the same direction. To begin laying down your rail network, start by placing down a pair of straight tracks first like we have here. Remember, in each pair of tracks, one of those tracks is for the purpose of going in one direction, the other track is for traveling in the opposite direction. How you switch directions is where junctions come in. Place your rail signals, which are the ones that look like a green, yellow, and red icon, which is this one here, the distance you want for your train. So this pair of tracks here will fit either a 242 setup or a 26 setup, or anything smaller than that on this block for each direction. At this point, I would also recommend taking a blueprint of the setup and that way you have it for future use when laying down your tracks. Another thing you can do is go ahead and place down electrical poles in the middle, and that way you can easily set up your electrical network along with your rail grid, but you can only do this as long as you have enough space dividing your top and bottom tracks. Usually it's a standard to have at least two train track widths in between your main tracks, Although some people nowadays are even recommending three train track widths in between your train tracks. So a distance more like this. And that way you can allow for things like roboports even inside of your main rail network. Once you decide it's time to change the direction of your rail system is when you need to add in a junction. There's many different types of junctions which we won't go through all of them today, but the two examples I have here are a T junction and a three-way junction. Here's the T junctions and this one is an example of a three-way junction. I don't have any runabout junctions here because I generally do not recommend them because if the runabout isn't big enough in the block, it can cause your train to end up crashing into itself, so use with caution. Starting with the T-junction though, we do have an example of a left-hand drive and a right-hand drive. The left-hand drive is over here as you can tell because the chain signals and the rail signals are facing more towards the middle or facing each other whereas the right-hand drive is over in this junction over here, and you can tell because the signals are faced more towards the outside of the tracks. Because I don't use left-hand drive, all future signaling will show right-hand drive from this point on. The rule of thumb that I use for deciding where to use my signals is actually pretty simple, and I only have three rules. So rule one, if the train goes through any area of track that intersects with another set of tracks, like it does here, and the block between the tracks is not big enough for the max size of my trains, then it requires a chain signal. Rule two, place a chain signal before every intersection, just like we have here. Rule three, place a regular rail signal at the end of every junction as long as there's enough space after it for the length of my max size train. I've done that here, for example. If there is not enough space, then I will use another chain signal. This is of course the completed version of that philosophy, but we'll go ahead and end up manually filling in the signals in this train junction here and talk about it as we go. To signal this junction, we're gonna go ahead and do it with right-hand drive, which again means that my signals are going to be facing the outside of the track. So that means if we're placing it on the outside, that that means the train is coming from right to left and going from right to up in that direction. So we're gonna start from this direction here. You can see that once I have the signal in my hand that we're given all of these little 
green icons, and that means that's an area where you can place your signal. But because we're at the start of the junction, we're gonna go ahead and follow rule two, which was to place a chain signal prior to every junction. So I'm gonna place it at the max spot I can, which is right there. Now looking at this piece here, I do know that it's gonna to have to require a chain signal because this area is not big enough to hold my max size train. So that's rule one, and I'm gonna go ahead and end up placing my chain signal there. And it's gonna go ahead and start blinking, and that's because it is looking for other signals to read, which once we go ahead and place those down, this should stop blinking. Following the rest of the train track upwards, we're gonna go ahead and place a regular rail signal at the very end of the junction, just like we follow with rule three, because at this point, we're assuming that there's enough train track, or at least this train track would continue along to allow for my max size train. So at this point, with just these three signals, we've gone ahead and already used rules one, two, and three. And from here on out, we basically just have to repeat those rules through the rest of the areas where it's applicable. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and continue from right and go leftwards. And we're gonna go ahead and use rule one, which means I have to use a chain signal in the areas where there's just not enough room to fit my max size train. So that means that goes there and there. And then we have to go ahead and use rule three, which means I have to use a rail signal after the junction has ended, which means that goes here. At this point, I've signaled as much as I can going from right to left on this track alone, but to signal everything else, we kind of have to start changing our angle or our viewpoint. So I'm gonna go ahead and now start from the top where I'm trying to imagine my train coming from top going to the bottom or entering this train junction. So using the same principles like we did earlier, because we're now viewing it as the start of the junction from this train track, we're gonna go ahead and place a chain signal there and then a chain signal here because it's just not big enough to hold my size train. Uh, we place one there and then another one goes here. We're gonna go ahead and use rule three again because this is considered the end of the junction on this track and place the regular rail signal right there. Now we've just got one more angle to end up signaling and that is the perspective of the train traveling from left and going upwards as well as left going through and to the right. So that means we're again at the start of the junction, which means we place the chain signal there. And then just like we've been doing for the blocks not big enough, we're gonna go ahead and place another chain signal there, there, and there. And looking back at it now, it looks like it is fully signaled now. It is fully complete, which means if you were to just use this type of signaling, you would prevent any crashing as well as promote as much train throughput as possible with this type of junction. Now looking at one last example is the three-way junction, which is this one here. And what that means is that from any given perspective, it can go one of three ways. So for example, starting from the right again and from the upper track, that means it can go either from right and to the top. It can go from the right and continue through going to the left-hand side, or it can go from the right and continue on and downward. The only direction it cannot go is back onto itself, which would be more of a roundabout, but like I talked about earlier, those are not typically recommended. But at this point, we're gonna go ahead and walk through how to go ahead and signal it manually, starting from scratch. We're gonna start from the same direction like we did last time, going from right and then all of the possible options. So I think we'll start from right and go upwards. So again, this means a chain signal at the beginning of the intersection and then we do a chain signal between all of the short intersections here or the short little blocks. Again, those are blinking, but that's okay. We'll fix it later by adding in all of the rest of the signals. And then we're already at the end of the junction here, which means a regular signal goes at the end. Now we're gonna start from again, the right and go just through on into the left. So we're continuing to place chain signals there, there, there. And then here's a tricky one. We're going to actually need a chain signal, whoops, here, because this tiny little thing is technically a block because there's technically uh, the start of an intersection going downwards here. So uh, to kind of change the rotation of your chain signal or your regular rail signal for it the matter, you can do that by, in my case, I press R, but whatever your rotate button is, go ahead and press that and you can tell from the shape or the orientation of the block it changes to 
the direction that it's facing. So we're gonna go ahead and change it going again from right to left so it clicks there. Then we can easily finish that off with a chain signal there and then a regular signal here. Now we have one last bit of track from the right hand side to finish which is continuing downwards. We've already signaled this section here and we just have to continue along this way. A chain signal goes there, another one here, and then we're finishing it off the junction with a regular rail signal there. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and finish the last two tracks without any commentary, but it will be coming from top to bottom and to the rest of the options, and then from this bottom left track going to the other options as well. We'll start with the top left track, however. All right, I think that looks complete, but let's double check by actually, again, clicking on either the rail or chain signal in your hand. And then you can take a look at it via the colors, which makes it a little bit easier to see how the blocks are divvied up. And right away, I can tell I missed a signal. I don't know if you guys can tell which one, but it's actually this one here. There we go. But I think I got everything else. I hope you were able to follow along with that and my reasoning for why I put the signals where I did, but if not, please feel free to ask a question in the comment section down below and I'll be glad to answer that for you as best as I can. And now we're back at the intersection where I started at the beginning of the video. And this is definitely a demonstration of how complex you can make your intersections. And while most of those three rules are used in the implementation of this intersection, there are a couple exceptions to that. I won't touch on those today, but if you do have any further questions or would like a follow-up video that touches on the more complex signaling issues, please let me know and I would be glad to do a follow-up video. There is one last thing I want to touch on though, even though I'm not gonna touch on the intricacies that go into signaling uh, such a large and complex intersection as this one, but I do wanna let you guys know just how you can signal for allowing your trains to go uh, basically reverse as well as forward, which is this type of intersection here. We just saw this train enter, but in just a couple of seconds, it's gonna go ahead and leave like it is now. And it's able to reverse because we are breaking one of those rules. And that rule is that we end up having two signals on the same type of track, which end up going actually in different directions. The way we're able to get away with this though is because we still follow the same rule of having a regular signal at the end of the junction, like we do here. And in just a minute, this train enters the intersection. It stops at the train station. But I'm guessing we're gonna be getting a no pathing error in just a second like we do here, because without the addition of another signal going in the opposite direction, it doesn't know how to leave the train station. The way we get around that is by having an additional chain signal facing the direction that you want the train to be exiting. So we can do that by placing it opposite of the regular signal right there, and then it can continue on. Well, we have about covered all of the basics that I can think of to get your simple rail networks planned and signaled. But if you guys have any additional questions, feedback, or requests for other tutorials, please let me know. I hope this was helpful. And as always, thank you guys for sticking around. But for now, this is Poober signing off until next time.